are truly honored to have our first speaker with us today. Dr. Sandroni is a professor of neurology at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, and she's the director of their autonomic labs. She's actively involved in clinical work, in research, and in education. She's a true expert in autonomic disorders and has been involved in research that can very well improve all of our lives. When I say our, because as parents and caregivers, our lives are impacted just as much as the patients. Her research has included work to characterize and describe the natural history of patients with autonomic disorders to assess their quality of life and she has conducted therapeutic, therapeutic trials to control the most disabling of symptoms. Dr. Sandroni has also been pursuing her interest in, in CRPS, complex regional pain syndrome, and in omnidimestasa, erythromyalgia. We at Dysautonomia International are extremely grateful to have her on our medical advisory board. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Dr. Sam Well, welcome all. Um, I don't think they uh, told you that this was going to be a stress test, actually, considering it's been in July in Washington, D.C., where the heat and the humidity is just perfect. <laughs> Anyway, um, what I thought I'll do, I'll give you some background a little bit to set the stage for all the other talks so you'll know um, what are the players in the autonomic nervous system. And uh, uh, for this portion, I really need to thank Dr. Ben Roach because these are his slides. He is one of the best educators that we have in the field, um, and he's great on anything that. Uh, basic neuroscience. Anyway, so I wanted to give you a little bit of an overview of the central autonomic pathways um, and then the anatomy of the sympathetic and the parasympathetic system, the effect of the outflow from the new system, and just a word on autonomic neurotransmission. I'll try not to be too boring. Um, message that uh, for motivation, um, emotion, so uh, these circuits are shared by the autonomic system, pain pathways, and mood, okay? And that's not surprising. Uh, when you have a stress response, you have all three systems involved to in various degree, okay? So, don't be surprised if when something happens to you, or if you have pain, or if you have a significant uh, visceral sensation, unpleasant or not, the whole system gets fired up. So these are the players, you don't have to remember all this. Maybe there is a test afterward that we won't have. <laughs> um, so my point is to remember that these are the same area that control motivation, control pain, and body sensation. Okay? So don't get upset if your doctor gives you an antidepressant sometimes. We use antidepressants for nausea, we use them for pain, and we use as antidepressants. Okay? So enough said of that. This is where, this is the hypothalamic areas. These areas is really the, uh, it's the CEO of the autonomic uh, control and regulates body function that has to be 
uh, in a very, very narrow range. Our body is a very delicate machine and works only within a uh, very limited range of temperature and, and control the blood pressure, controls our need for sleep, need for, uh, for food, etc. Then there are the areas of pain modulation. Again, in these, whenever you have uh, pain, there is, that's a stress response. And what does the autonomic system do? Fires up. Okay? So remember that every time you have a stress, physical, emotional, or otherwise, environmental, your autonomic system is reacting. That's what it's supposed to do. Um, so you cannot ignore the interaction. And if we go further down, you go all the way, that we have various stations. This is the, the base of the brain. This is the brain stem, which is the back of the brain. And here we're going down the cord. There is a whole set of neurons. That some of them really do very specific things. Control breathing, uh, breathing pattern, control blood pressure, control cardiovascular responses, control, uh, help control temperature, modulate gastrointestinal reflex, bladder function, etc., etc. And then we have the pain modulation areas, which are really the same area. Again, the two pathways are always controlled at the same level. So um, if you go by system, we have all these major areas. Um, and again, at the top level, the higher part of the brain, you have behavioral responses, awareness of your body, function of what's going on in your tummy and whatnot, emotion, stress responses, maintaining uh, a stable level of functioning in the body, integration of autonomic function and arousal and pain modulation at the second level, again the brain stem areas. And here we have the tonic control of all these functions. So here you start having the effect. Here everything is integrated, the message goes down, they say, yes sir, I'll do it. Okay? And then there are some sympathetic level and the sacral level, um, so lower down in the spine that have controls that not necessarily uh, reach all the way to the brain. Uh, there, are, there are really uh, reflexes that are, can be dissociated. And again, we have different levels at which the, the body can interact with itself. Uh, and that allows us to have some redundancy in the system. So if one system uh, fails, uh, not, not everything is automatically destroyed and nothing works. For instance, for bladder function, we have five centers at various levels uh, that can control. Um, I think I'm going to skip this. This is pretty much the same. Now, this is really a short version of what all the function that we, the, the autonomic system does. So. We have various nuclei that are involved, and we have uh, um, nuclei in the craniocervical region. And what do they do? Well, they control tear, they control uh, salivary gland, they control uh, the tone of, uh, of blood vessels in the craniocervical region and the brain. And um, there are also uh, sweat glands in the face that are also involved but the, the control is not in the cranial nerve region, it's further down, it's pretty much in the supraclavical region in the shoulder area, there are ganglions here. Then there are levels all the way down in the spinal cord, all the way down to our tailbone, and all of these control blood vessels and sweat glands to the limbs. There is a very important system, which is the enteric nervous system, which is almost a system on its own, and controls all the uh, gut function. Um, then we have uh, uh, control of bladder, sexual organs, and we have a very important system, which is the adrenal medulla. Uh, that's a critical one, because that's involved in any stress response. Without that, you die. Okay? People with adrenal insufficiency, before that was known, and before we had cortisol, these people would not make it. So it's a very, very important system. What does this do when it, whenever it's activated? Release mediators in the blood to allow us to keep the blood pressure and keep us alive, really. 
So it's a very, very important system. Um, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic system work. In some organs, they do things uh, opposite to each other to modulate it. In other organs, they work together in a synergistic way. Uh, to give an example, the sympathetic nervous system, what does it do at the cardiac level? Increase the heart rate, the parasympathetic, decrease the heart rate. The gut level, they do the opposite, one uh, favor motility, the parasympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic doesn't do a whole lot. Again, for instance, in other uh, organs, such as the uh, organ of reproduction, they have to work together. Uh, so, some components are very specific to one or the other and allow us to see when a patient comes with a certain complaint for us to say, okay, this is predominantly this type of uh, pathology or predominantly another one. More commonly than not, you have a combination because these two systems do not work in a separate compartment. They work in a balance. It's a well-tuned balance. So if one is off, the other one is off as well to some extent. Um, this is just a, a, a different way of seeing it. There are various neurotransmitters that you may have heard of. One you probably have heard about are the catecholamines, are norepinephrine. There are a lot of others that are involved. I'm not going to bore you with that. And there is a test afterward, but don't worry about it. Um, and all of these do something slightly different. One is uh, can dilate the pupil. This one at this level uh, create vasoconstriction in the skin, can create sweating responses, etc., etc. So even the same mediator depending which organ goes, the effect is different, okay? So you don't, if I have uh, someone having a sudden uh, surge of catecholamines, it's not gonna be just one thing that changes. All these things will change, okay? It's not just gonna have, oh, I'm gonna have a tachycardia. No, 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 no. Everything else is gonna happen as well. Mm -hmm. That's the way the body uh, works. Again, another, uh, another way of saying this. So uh, this is the vagus nerve, which is the most important parasympathetic nerve in the body overall. And let me just give you a summary here. As I said, the two systems work. In some things, they are in opposite uh, effect. And other times, they do things in combination. The classic example is the sexual organ. You cannot just have one or the other to have a perfect function. You have to have both. One does one thing, and the other one does the other component. So, but you have a sense here that how, what kind of things one system or the other can do. Mm -hmm. And again, for some system, one is completely dominant, such as for sweating, it's completely sympathetic, or even. Um, and in, G and in the gastrointestinal tract, the most important system is really the parasympathetic. The sympathetic doesn't do that much, really. So again, this was just for you to get the sense of how complicated the system is, how many players are involved, and the multiple level uh, that are affected. We are really a pretty fancy machine, you know? Okay, so let's start a minute talking about uh, I'm trying to give you a little bit of an overview of the autonomic disorders. I know that most of you are in reality are post tachycardia patients. Um, and I know there will be talk about that afterward, or Raji will do that. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit of the, the approach that we have when we have patients that complains of uh, feeling dizzy, lightheaded, what have you, and how we uh, classify autonomic disorders. And mainly I'm going to tell you what you are not. Okay, um, because I think sometimes there is a bit of confusion and uh, I want to put things a little bit in perspective because misinformation doesn't help anyone. If you are labeled with the wrong diagnosis, chances are you're going to receive the wrong treatment and it's not good. Okay, so let's, why do we get dizzy sometimes when we stand, providing you are not in 95 degrees with 2,000% humidity and <laughs> not run or have not slept or whatever. Well, normally, when we stand, 75% of our uh, blood volume drops below heart level. 
Now, some of us are more lucky than others. If you're shorter, well, that's a less of a draw. Uh, but obviously, there are compasses. Well, think about the giraffe. You think it's a joke? Uh -huh. Imagine you're a giraffe and you get dizzy. Um, so, there are obviously compensatory mechanisms for this. And there are various players. There is never just one system in the body. The body is smart. We have compensatory mechanism and we have redundancy, thankfully. So if one fails, generally the other can still supply. So we have venous valves and pumping of the venous system, pumping the blood back up. You can increase the pump function of the heart. We have vasoconstriction uh, of the blood vessels, which is probably one of the major players. And when these mechanisms don't work, well, generally we collapse. And collapsing is a, uh, a mechani mechanism of defense. The body tries to protect the brain. Of course, we are neurologists, so we think the brain is the most important organ anyway. <laughs> yeah. um, but without brain, well, we can't survive. So when you are down on the floor, it may not be fun, but at that point, the blood flows back to the brain. So we have various degree of severity of, auto autonomic, uh, of orthostatic disorders. Um, not every patient that complains of lightheadedness uh, has problem with blood pressure control upon standing. Uh, you patient will describe things with the same words and describe completely different concepts for us. Um, I usually tell my resident that the patient says, I'm numb, I'm dizzy, I'm weak, and can mean just exactly everything. Uh, and the opposite of that, uh, to what we consider dizzy, weak, or numb. Um, and this is one example. So, patient may be lightheaded because uh, they may have a vestibular problem, an inner ear problem, something else, or may true be a problem with blood pressure. Um, also, there is through the other way around. Some patient may have orthostatic hypotension, that is a significant drop in blood pressure when standing, and have no symptoms. And some patient may have it and have some atypical symptoms. Now, that's more common in the elderly, um, and much less so in the younger population or young adult, like most boss patients generally are. Now, orthostatic disorders can be an isolated symptom or can be part of a more process with a clear-cut autonomic pathology, either central or peripheral. Um, orthostatic hypotension, per se, usually is not present in the autonomic dysfunctional syndrome, where orthostatic intolerance is prevalent and the prognosis is much better. What do we mean with that? Well, there is a big overlap in these entities. Orthostatic hypotension, Syncope, orthostatic intolerance, which, which pause is uh, the greatest uh, uh, subgroup. Um, this one, technically for us, is the most severe. Syn Oops. Anyway, syncope um, can be very benign. I think um, most of us at some point in our life will pass out. Could be a situational event. Uh, it's very common in teenagers, and usually it's very benign, doesn't require any specific intervention. In the elderly, if it's a nuance, a syncope usually is more malignant. Usually it's a cardiac problem, could be other situations. This is the best one, okay, from a prognosis standpoint. So how do we define this as this sort of static intolerance? Well, the reduced capacity to tolerate standing position. Uh, now this can happen for many reasons. I may have a broken leg that hurts like the dick in it, so I cannot stand. <laughs> well, we're not talking about this, okay? We, here we are concerned about orthostatic hypotension, pause, and symptom. <clears throat> the definition of pause, uh, it's pretty uh, straightforward. We have a heart rate increment of 30 beats per minute, uh, Ideally, we want a maximum heart rate above 120 within five minutes of uh, having the patient standing up. And that there must be symptoms of orthostatic intolerance. Um, if the patient has an increment 
of 35 and have no symptoms, we don't worry about it, we don't treat it, we don't treat numbers, we treat people, okay? Um, demographics generally is the condition of young folks. Uh, females win 5 to 1 or lose 5 to 1, depending on which way you see it. Uh, the prevalence, we still have pretty old data, we still needed to redo our population study, but about 170 to 400,000. It's much more common, five, ten times, than orthostatic hypotension, but this is an estimate. Um, the symptoms are classic of, that you all know. Uh, you'll hear about that more, so I'm not going to uh, belabor too much on this. There are subtypes. Again, this will be discussed further later. Uh, and again, I'm not going to go in detail. Um, the only one I'm going to mention in a minute is the, the one with the, that we call the neuropathic pot, that is a pot with peripheral innervation. How do we access that? Um, we do a bunch of testing, and usually uh, patients with this subgroup type have some subtle abnormality of sweating, which usually is of no clinical bearing. Um, but it's enough for us to say, ah, there is a little bit of a nerve damage here. Uh, we have, can have some abnormality on uh, another test that we do. For those of, of you that have a full autonomic study done, we call it the Valsalva maneuver. We make people blow through a bugle. We see a nice pattern on the blood pressure that we monitor. If there is an abnormality in that pattern, we call it. There has been study done inserting a needle into the peripheral nerve and checking uh, the pattern of burst of sympathetic tone, and that's reduced uh, in some of these folks. And the um, nerve fiber in the skin is reduced in this subtype of pot. And that's an example of we can see on patients with the subtypes when we do a, a sweat test. This is a very interesting test. If any of you have done it, kids like it, they feel like they turn, like they look like Barney. Um, we dust them with a powder that's a yellow-orange when it's a dry and turns purple when it's red. So at the end of the test, oh yeah, the patient is shoved in an oven like a turkey at Thanksgiving. <laughs> and when they're ready, there is a, a thermostat that pops up. I said, oh, okay. By then the patient should be totally purple. Okay? Some patients with a neuropathic pot may have this kind of profile so they don't sweat in the feet which again has no clinical bearing whatsoever, no panic if you have that form. It's just for us to say, okay, this is a neuropathic subtype. Um, and we see with uh, this subtype, when we do microneurography, again, impaling a, a nerve with a needle, instead of seeing this nice pattern of squiggly lines in a normal subject, we see pretty much dead zone, only a couple of little spikes. And uh, uh, the skin biopsy, this is a normal subject. You see these little squiggly twigs. This is not fog. This is just a patient that does not have those fibers, and that's a patient with pulse with a neuropathic barrier. Now, the trademark usually that tells us what's going on is really the tilt study. That's what we really rely on our diagnosis on. This is a normal patient. This is a heart rate systolic and diastolic blood pressure. Patient is tilted up here, tilted back down here. You can hardly see that much has happened if I don't tell you that the patient has been tilted, right? This is a past patient. <laughs> Anyone see a difference here? Okay. Now, by definition, the orthostatic intolerance without OH here, uh, the blood pressure should not drop. Otherwise, the tachycardic response is not inappropriate is appropriate. Again, it will be a defense mechanism, a compensatory mechanism. This is a different patient. This is a patient that had a vasovagal syncope. Again, it can happen to anyone, very different situations. At some point, everything is cool, but all of a sudden, boom, blood pressure and heart rate take a nosedive, and so does the patient. <laughs> and this can happen, again, very common, young adults, uh, sometimes people when we draw blood or whatever. Okay? So some people are more from than others. There is another entity that we call vasodepressor syncope. In this case, the pressure drops 
abruptly. The heart rate actually sometimes even goes up to compensate. Um, this is a, a different type of syncope, but again, nothing to do generally with POTS, although patients with POTS may have uh, syncope if we keep you guys up long enough. And will look more, can look sometimes like this, or can look more like a vasovagal syncope. Uh, can, go, can go both ways. Uh, but these can exist completely in isolation, and patients with this usually are monosymptomatic. They say, I pass out once in a while, no big deal, generally, unless this happens very, very frequently. A completely different entity, and I'm beginning to talk about orthostatic hypotension now, is delayed orthostatic hypotension. These are folks that they start well, but the longer they stand, the worse they feel. Uh, this is probably the mildest form of orthostatic hypotension that we have. Um, as they worsen, the interval shortens until they really cannot function. Again, very different from a patient with post You see here the heart rate uh, goes up a little um, and actually keeps climbing up, trying to keep up with the blood pressure, not inappropriate in this case. Okay. This is a classic example of a patient with uh, orthostatic hypotension. These are patients that are uh, more severe. These are patients that have a lesion. You guys, and the dysfunctional syndromes, uh, you have all the proper pieces in order. They just, they don't play together. They are like an orchestra that the players are out of tune. So we just need to reset. This patient, well, sometimes there is no uh, concert master first bio. So they are really in trouble. Okay? And uh, here in this case, the heart rate still try to do something. There is no way they can support this blood pressure that's really dropping below the shoes of this patient. This patient is not a happy camper, I can tell you that. <laughs> so what are the symptoms of orthostatic hypotension? Uh, you recognize that some of these are very common to some of you. Like I it. Weak, tired, blurry vision, they feel foggy, they feel stupid, they feel that they have no ambition, is my favorite definition. Uh, headache, they may feel uh, vertiginous, and they generally become pale. What are the causes of orthostatic hypotension? Well, uh, there are quite a few. Sometimes we simply don't know. The famous idiopathic, terrible word that everyone jokes uh, means that the doctor is an idiot and the patient is pathetic. <laughs> the first thing we like to look for medications. There are a lot of drugs. The average American takes more drugs, I think, than any other human being on the planet. Uh, more or less appropriately. And we cannot argue about that. Um, anyway, a lot of drugs taken for other reasons can cause orthostatic hypertension. Um, some antidepressant, medication for uh, guys for uh, prostatic hypertrophy, a lot of different possibilities, but I always look at drugs when a patient comes that have problems with orthostatic hypotension. Other things, patient that had cancer um, of the cranial cervical region, they have neck dissection, they have radiation. In the past, we didn't worry much about these folks because they didn't make it, they died within a relatively short period of time. Now, the treatment are better, so these folks live longer, but unfortunately, in the neck, there are a lot of sensors that helps uh, controlling the, the blood pressure, and so these folks can have significant issue. Then we have patients with a central nervous system disorder, and the top of the line, have it all, worst of all, is multiple system atrophy. Uh, you can have autonomic insufficiency due to cord lesion, myelopathies, that's what they are, or autonomic neuropathies. There are quite a few. Uh, Dr. Chmali, after me, will talk about the secondary forms. Now, let me just say a word about orthostatic hypotension and the old folks. Don't ask me the definition of old folks. It's anything <laughs> older than I am, right? <laughs> right. Uh, it's not a trivial issue. Um, because a lot of uh, these folks have atypical symptoms or even they are asymptomatic. But even if they have no symptoms when their blood pressure drops, they may be at risk for sudden falls because they may have sudden lapse 
uh, loss of consciousness, and they may not even remember it. And uh, they may therefore fall. They have no idea why they fell. Nothing is found sometimes on exam if you don't think about checking the blood pressure. And these folks end up in a nursing home because they keep falling. Uh, so one way that we uh, have been discussing among us uh, when we do the course at the academy of uh, how to classify autonomic disorder, we have decided to go with the models that is used in a lot of other uh, pathologies. That is a structural disease, which is a well-defined, you see it, something is broken, you may or may not be able to fix it, but you see it, you know it's broken, um, and the examples are, again, conditions such as multiple system atrophy, diabetic autonomic neuropathy, neck radiation resulting in failure of the reflex that control um, the blood pressure and heart rate, or can be a functional disorder. And here we're not using functional as in um, somatoform disorder, but in a change in function. So more precisely, we should call it dysfunction, right? Um, so the pathology here is less well defined. Um, if I, I show you before the example of parts of the neuropathic variant. Now those changes are pretty sudden. Nothing overwhelming per se. Um, and if you think your, the amount of symptoms that people experience is way out of proportion. So we can see this much damage and this much symptoms, this much symptoms. Well, in this situation we see this much damage, and the symptoms may or may not be that bad. Because these forms sometimes evolve more slowly, the patient adapt, until of course they are at the end when they cannot compensate anymore. So it's just a um, completely different way that the, the, the two diseases evolve, the two forms of disease evolve. So, and these syndromes almost always have a lot of company. Uh, we're being re recognizing more and more that orthostatic intolerance um, patient may also have irritable bowel syndrome, they may have interstitial cystitis, they may have fibromyalgia, they may have chronic fatigue. And depending upon what's the key uh, factor for the specific patient, they may present it to cardiology, gastroenterology, etc. Okay? But more often than not, these come in clusters. So, uh, this was a, a slide that Dr. Chelimsky put together. It's, it's a part of our course that we do every year at the academy. Again, uh, in the structural forms, seems counterintuitive, but that's how our body sometimes is. Uh, but sometimes the patient has a tendency to minimize the complaint. They're generally stoic, actually. Almost to the point that you just say, come on, real. And uh, usually there is a fight between the family and the patient sometimes in the room about that. Well, the dysfunctional syndrome, the patient is overwhelmed by the number of complaints, and so are the physicians, and our test shows uh, really, really very little to go after. Uh, you may have heard the term of functional dyspepsia and whatnot. Our clinical diagnosis, basically, by definition, you need to have a bunch of negative tests you know the patient is suffering and you still cannot find a full lot. Or you find, again, this much and you cannot explain how with five cents you can buy something for one dollar. Um, and one of the theories is that the, at the brainstem level there are maybe a, a, an altered filter. The brainstem, as I told you, there are, if you remember, you have all those different levels. At that point, a lot of integration, the signal comes in. And that's where the patient may turn on and off the amplifier, not voluntarily, but that's what the, the body does. And based on that, the patient may have an excessive response, as if, again, you turn the amplifier, if you turn this, the volume up here, you're going to be completely, ah, ah, stop, 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 there is an echo, etc. Not that my voice has changed, because the signal has been processed differently. And that's what's happening in these forms, okay? So the key is how do we reset the filter, and that's, uh, that's the key. Anyway, so in terms of, uh, uh, you may have heard about, you, have in a, you are in a hyperadrenergic state. Huh? Everyone heard this before? Yeah? 
Okay, so what we, what we call that? Well, one is just uh, by definition, uh, by description. If I drink too much coffee, I'm going to feel palpitation, I'm going to feel jittery, I'm going to feel anxious, I may shake a little bit. Hyperadrenergic state means basically that. You are with too much caffeine in you, which is the norepinephrine. Um, so in this entity, the response is excessive. In these other forms, when the patient has a lesional condition, they cannot generate what's supposed to be a normal response. So you have too much, they have too little. So let's talk about this function of these autonomias. Again, we can further classify them as painful and non-painful. Um, most of you generally do not have pain with this unless you have also one of these other accompanying syndromes. And again, a lot of these uh, refer to uh, visceral sensation. Uh, we know that migraine is also very common in these conditions. Migraine is a functional disorder. Migraine is a vasomotor instability and an instability again at the brainstem level. Um, so not surprisingly, this all come together. Okay? We may have other conditions that are extremely common, like Raynaud's phenomena. Uh, most of us can have it in absence of any other manifestation or can be part of more complex syndrome. So things can happen in any combination or sometimes you may have things in isolation. The one that generally is monosymptomatic and does not keep any company is a syncope. So let's talk about the structural ones. So we can talk about the more central or the peripheral nervous systems. Um, as I mentioned, the top of the line is multiple system atrophy. Uh, you may have heard also Parkinson disease and Lewy body spectrum disease. Sometimes you may have other pathology like strokes, demalinating disorder, multiple sclerosis, that depending upon where they hit in the brain and the cord may cause this autonomia. Then you may have uh, uh, the one related to cord injuries, inflammatory, traumatic, uh, whatever, and these can cause uh, autonomic uh, uh, dysreflexia. We'll talk about that in a minute. Then you have the peripheral nervous system involvement. One is a degenerative form called pure autonomic failure. It's uh, the, the neurons die out. Uh, is the let's say is the uh, autonomic nervous system equivalent of uh, Lou Gehrig disease. Okay. Uh, you'll know probably what Lou Gehrig disease is, right? Then there are the inflammatory ganglionopathies, which at least in theory, or at least in part, should be irreversible. And then autonomic neuropathies, and again, Dr. Chimali will talk more about those. So by definition, um, when we have autonomic neuropathies, we have involvement of fibers that normally uh, are hardly seen when we do a uh, nerve biopsy. This is a snapshot of a nerve uh, seen under, uh, under uh, electron microscopy. This big uh, fat tire that you see here, this is a large fiber. These are the fibers that convey, let's say, uh, sensation or do uh, convey uh, motor power, etc. Then there are smaller fibers that convey uh, different kind of uh, sensations such as cold um, and some pain. And then you see these little grapes sort of thing there. You can hardly see it, right? So are they important? Yeah, guess what? Those are the amalinated fiber. Guess what the autonomic fibers are? Those. Okay? <laughs> so and those fibers also convey uh, there is another subset and they convey heat and pain. Okay? So when we have a small fiber neuropathy, more commonly we have involvement at this domain. So you'll have all those combinations. We have a bunch of autonomic neuropathies, acute and chronic, and again, Dr. Chimali will go over that. I'm going to talk a moment about the primary autonomic neuropathy, not the secondary one. I don't want to say a word about this. These are the hereditary sensory autonomic neuropathies. Now, these are a group of disorders of various severity, and actually, except in one form, 
uh, maybe two. The autonomic component, although present, is not uh, dominating the picture at all. The sensory deficits are in this pose, okay? So these patients have usually prominent sensory loss, uh, particularly to pain and temperature. Um, they have a lot of problem with, uh, with this, because if you don't feel heat and pain, you can injure yourself without realizing it. Um, and actually, you may have spontaneous ulceration, the skin breaks off, the joint breaks off, you may have auto-amputation, really. So, pretty ugly. Um, and some of these patients have autonomic involvement. Again, there are only two forms that are really significant I want to talk about. So, without uh, going into much uh, detail of each single uh, form, there are basically the autosomal dominant, which are the type 1, or in the autosomal recessive, the type 2. The dominant means you have it, your kids have 50% chance of having it as well. And these patients start usually in the second decade or later. They have lancinating pain, variable weakness, distal sweat loss, which in itself is not a big deal, really. They may have uh, uh, GI dysmotility, they may have hearing loss, and they may become form also can have some cognitive difficulties. In the autosomal recessive, these have very common uh, uh, ulceration and loss of uh, fingers and toes. <coughs> so really bad condition. Uh, they may have some distal weakness, they may have some cognitive involvement, and there are a couple of forms that have significant autonomic involvement. Now let me say a word about autonomic, because I understand that the name per se does not mean a whole lot. Uh, technically means that it's familiar, runs in family, and there is an autonomic dysfunction. So what's the big deal? It would be very generic, isn't it? Unfortunately, historically, this term has been used, and I really, really appreciate if it could be reserved to this group of patients, uh, also known as Riley Day Syndrome. This is a devastating condition. So. Uh, some of us sometimes react a little annoyed when patients come because, oh, my mom used to faint, I faint, my kid faint, we have familiar dysautonomia. Um, that's really belittling a little bit this condition. Um, this is essentially exclusive to the Ashkenazi population. There is a very specific gene mutation and now all of them are tested so Hopefully, this disease will become extinct in the near future. It's a very severe disorder with absence of sensory neuron and autonomic neurons. It's congenital. This starts at birth, not at age 20, not at age 50, at birth. Okay? Most of these folks don't make it to age 50, they die. Hmm? They have insensitivity to pain, they have lack of taste, lack of tears, skin blotches. They have poor growth, blood pressure, intestinal dysmotility, you name it. And then they have this unbelievable visceral crisis. You think, gosh, you know, they have no tears, they have no pain. Wonderful. Right? This is heaven. On the other hand, they can experience this absolutely horrendous visceral crisis with uh, terrific pain, uh, spike in blood pressure, a lot of instability in uh, autonomic function. They have swallowing difficulty, they may have some movement disorder, they develop scoliosis. And uh, despite a lot of supportive uh, uh, treatment that now we have, in the past they used to die in infancy. Now they make it uh, mid-adult age. So. so that's what familiar dysautonomia is. Okay? Now, let me talk about uh, autonomic dysreflexes. This can happen from a condition usually can happen either for a significant central disorders affecting the brain and the, affecting the hypothalamus region, which is, as I mentioned before, sort of the CEO of the autonomic function, um, or for, this fun uh, for lesion at the cord level. So the, the upper level and the lower level of the cord are disconnected and uh, the body reacts in a non-coordinated fashion. So it's a different way of having a dysfunction here, okay? Um, 
most commonly, these can be uh, triggered by stimuli in the, in, the, in the area of the body below the lesion. So the most common thing will be distended bladder, distended bowel, uh, even a stupid urinary tract infection can precipitate one of these. Uh, pain, uh, ingrown toenail, an abscess, I mean something even really stupid can trigger uh, this absolute spike. Again, there is a dissociation, so what should be a normal response, a normal trigger, becomes with a, an absolutely uh, exaggerated uh, response. The patient may have throbbing headaches, uh, paresthesias, and may have stuffy nose, uh, pupillary dilatation, sweating, flushing. What are the mechanisms? Um, again, somewhere here the system is uh, uh, broken up and you lose the usual nice tight modulation that's key to, to the system. So uh, the patient may experience, depending upon which level this happens, we can have it with peripheral lesion, means the uh, receptor the sense what the pressure does and send a message to adapt and react to that change in pressure are cut off. It's as if, put it this way, it's as if you, uh, you have a thermostat in your house that goes uh, berserk. Okay? At that point, you may have the air conditioning that goes on when the house temperature is 50 degrees, or the furnace goes on and the house is already at 85 degrees. Okay? You lose that capacity to modulate. So anywhere at this level you may have uh, this. So it can happen at the court level, uh, you can have it in the brainstem level, you can have it for central uh, condition. And we're talking here generally pretty uh, severe condition, usually massive uh, trauma, massive CNS bleed uh, or stroke, um, tumors that uh, hit this region, etc. Uh, let me just skip that. So, um, very common, you can see it with the cord lesion. Again, anything that trigger, uh, that normally would trigger a response. It's a normal response. If your bladder is full, your pressure rise, okay? But won't rise of 50 millimeter of mercury, it won't rise of 5, 10. That's normal. In this patient, it will spike off the roof, okay? So it's a, again, it's loss of the control. So prevention is the best. And so, uh, we make sure that the bladder is always empty, they have a bowel program, there are no infection, because they often have lost the sensation, we make sure that there is no uh, fracture or whatever that they are not aware of, but still will trigger their response. Um, now let's say a word about Parkinsonian disorder. Uh, these are a group of disease that based upon the type of protein that accumulates in the cells and kills the neurons, we call them synucleinopathies. Okay, it's a mouthful, don't worry, but you're not going to be tested on this. Um, these are the, the, the form, Parkinson, multiple system atrophy, Lewy body disease. There is a whole other set of uh, a neurodegenerative disorder, the most famous being Alzheimer's disease, and there is a whole bunch of that. Those accumulate a completely different protein that we call tau. They do not have autonomic involvement generally. Synucleinopathies do. Um, these are the prevalence. Now, Parkinson's disease is very common. Multiple system atrophy is much less common. Um, patient with Parkinson's disease will have some autonomic dysfunction at some point which only in a fraction of them is really severe. On the other hand, because they are, we have so many Parkinson patients, even if only 10% of them develop significant symptoms, can be still a significant population. Multiple system atrophy has a very complicated set of criteria that are listed there. These are patients that by definition have severe autonomic dysfunction. Um, however, they are not very, very common. Again, much, much less common uh, in terms of frequency than Parkinsonian uh, patients. But they may look alike at the beginning. They all may present with a Parkinsonian feature, but they have a different 
uh, appearance in different response to treatment. They may have also involvement of the cerebellar system. They have other features. They all develop uh, usually uh, sleep disorders. Are the patient that kicks and scream in their sleep? Parkinson patient can do that too. But they also have irregular breathing at night. They will start having strider. And before we realize this, these folks used to die in their sleep because of it. So these are very, very compromised folks. Um, so again, these are this family of disorder. MSA is the biggest one and the most severe one. Uh, in terms of severity, we have MSA is the most severe from an autonomic standpoint. I'm talking only autonomic here. Diffused with body disease, and then we have Parkinson, then we have pyrotonomic failure. So um, they all have a, a Parkinsonian feature. Diffused with body disease, also they have significant cognitive impairment uh, and hallucination. Patient with MSA never, almost never, I say never, but pretty much do not have any cognitive difficulty. Sleep disturbance. This can predate the onset of the actual clinical uh, manifestation for many years, even decades. So pay attention if you have uh, friends, family members that act out their dreams. I'm not talking any nightmares. I'm talking really getting out of bed or punching people or hitting the furniture, etc., etc. Um, when they they are very severe, they end up that we have to let them sleep alone in an empty room with a mattress on the floor so they don't injure themselves or others. And they have uh, very peculiar breathing disturbances. They need to be recognized because they need to be supported with breathing at night. Otherwise, they will die in their sleep. This is an example of a um, field study in a patient with multiple system atrophy. In the green um, is the heart rate, systolic, diastolic blood pressure. Now, they have significant drop in blood pressure, so they have orthostatic hypotension, but look what they do. They compensate, so they create a supine when they are horizontal. Their blood pressure goes very high. That's the way that they cook with this, because this evolved over uh, time, so they have time to adapt. So generally for us, the challenge is to convince the primary care physician not to treat that hypertension. If you treat that hypertension, the patient cannot function. See, they drop, but here the blood pressure dropped to about 100 systolic, which is perfectly fine. Most of us probably here, I mean, a bunch of us will have probably blood pressure around 100 systolic. So that's how they fall. Remember the little toes uh, dryness that I showed before? This is what these people look like. They look very, very different. Um, this may also look like someone that had a cord lesion. Actually, it's a patient with uh, MSA in evolution. Um, very extensive loss of swelling. And this is actual picture of the patient. This is what they look like. So they are exactly the opposite of what uh, I showed before. Uh, a patient with mild form don't sweat in their feet. They do the opposite. It seems like they have purple blood in stocking zone. They lose the central sweating. And this sweating loss is significant. These people cannot tolerate heat. They are really at risk of heat stroke. Okay? It's a combination here, other pictures. Treatment is always supported. There's been a gazillion of trials, one more dismal than the other, unfortunately. Um, they respond transiently and not terrifically, usually, to the medication they use for Parkinson patients. The problem is also that that medication can worsen the orthostatic hypotension. So a lot of what we do is regarding managing their orthostatic hypotension. The fluid, the salt, the stockings, and then the medications. Very important bladder care, we all develop neurogenic bladder. And again, tracheostomy to prevent the death in, the, in their sleep. And physical therapy, occupational therapy. Uh, to keep them uh, in speech therapy, to keep them functional as much as possible. Uh, it can be very, very fast in some of them, others be longer, and you need to support her as much as they can. At some point, they need a feeding tube, etc. Um, I think I'm going to skip that. So in terms of management of the major storms, 
that I mentioned before, besides the uh, trying to prevent a trigger, there are a lot of drugs that we can use, uh, but those are syndromes that are very difficult and definitely should be left in the hands of the specialist. Other condition that can cause autonomic instability that you may encounter, you may not think about it, you may not hear much about it, patient with multiple sclerosis, they may develop hypothermia. Uh, and I'm talking severe hypothermia, so they, they really, they're stuporous sometimes, they just don't function, okay? Um, and it's very hard to control. Other patients with hypothalamic pathology, again, uh, can have autonomic storms. Seizure disorders, they may have paroxysmal autonomic activation or even ictal syncope. There are a variety of bizarre conditions like this one that have, uh, uh, it's an a, uh, autoimmune syndrome and the patient presents with excessive sweating, agitation, confusion, and muscle twitching. Again, conditions such as Alzheimer's disease do not normally have autonomic insufficiency. Just a word on the bladder management. Uh, there are really three big groups of problems. Patient cannot control, patient cannot avoid, or urgency. Uh, usually it's due to loss of control or the generation of the system that controls the bladder. Uh, urgency is generally due to changes in the spinal circuits, and it's the easiest one usually to manage. Uh, depending upon how severe it is, we really need to make sure that the patient has the bladder empty, otherwise the risk of infection goes up. Plus, again, as I mentioned before, they may have other autonomic instability with it. So we can use medication. Unfortunately, medication for bladder may worsen the blood pressure problem. So sometimes we just resort to self-catheterization. Um, and anyway, you have to tailor everything based on the patient. And last but not least, the bowel can go either way. More commonly, autonomic failure uh, has constipation. Diarrhea is more common in uh, the dysfunctional syndrome where you may have alternating diarrhea or can be uh, due to uh, bacterial overgrowth. If the patient has that constipation for a little while, then the bacterial grow, 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 and then you have an explosion. Um, so we try to be proactive, a variety of regimen that we can use it to help either one. Again, trying to balance side effects of medication that can affect other uh, components. And that's it, and I think I'm on time. <laughs>